A Mucky Business with Tim Farron. Hello and welcome. I'm Tim Farron. This is the show where you get to hear from a Christian politician about how they live out their faith in the mucky business of politics. Lots of Christians steer clear of politics. They think it's tainted by compromise and sin. They're right. It is tainted by compromise and sin. But then again, so is everything else since the fall. And I think Christians should be praying for their brothers and sisters who are in politics and doing so in an informed way. Well, today we're going to speak to Dame Andrea Leadsom, who very nearly became the leader of the Conservative Party. If she had, she'd have been the Prime Minister. She's had several top jobs, though, and we're going to be asking her whether it's right for a Christian to be ambitious in politics. Andrea was also incredibly influential in the EU debate, starring in that big Wembley event that possibly changed the course of British history. But what stories can she tell us about what that felt like at the time? All of that to come. But first, Cara Bentley has a roundup of some of the stories that you might have missed. Well, we like to keep you up to date about stories which you might not have seen elsewhere. And something that might interest you if your church runs a food bank or a debt centre or anything like that is that the government has just launched its Faith New Deal pilot fund, which is basically a scheme that encourages faith groups to work with local authorities. And this was inspired by the work of many MPs, including the Christian MP Danny Kruger, the Conservative MP for Devizes, but also the Christian Labour MP Stephen Timms, both of whom worked on separate reports about how their should be more trust and more interaction between places like churches that are already good at solving local social problems such as homelessness and state bodies who might have the methods or resources that faith groups can benefit from as well. So if you're interested in that, you can go to the government website. And the debate on assisted dying is heating up. A bill has been proposed that would allow terminally ill, mentally competent adults to request assistance to die at a time and place of their choosing, subject to approval by two doctors and a High Court judge. Now, six years ago, an attempt to change the law was defeated in Westminster, and this bill, which started life in the House of Lords, will be debated there on the 22nd of October. And outside the House of Lords, two former Archbishops of Canterbury are on different sides of this debate. But Tim, welcome back. I'm sure there'll be lots more parliamentary debates and government discussions that we'll cover on this show, this series. Well, thanks, Cara. Yes, as Alan Partridge discovered, getting that second series can be difficult. So as we celebrate the beginning of our second season, it's important that we don't waste our opportunity. So much has happened over the summer, as you rightly say, Cara. The West's withdrawal from Afghanistan with all the tragedy that has followed the new military alliance in the Pacific, refugees being turned back in the English Channel at home, the government's plan to increase national insurance to pay for health and social care, the universal credit cut, the rising gas prices and the row over vaccine passports and vaccinations for children and young people. You'll be unsurprised to discover that I have pretty firm opinions on most of these, and you'll be relieved to discover that I'm not about to foist them on you at this point. The one thing I do want to get across is that these things matter. Christians should not panic in the face of tumultuous events at home or abroad. God is sovereign. All things are in his hands. We are in his hands. And those are very safe hands. As Christians, we can know that God is leading his people to a point where we are promised that the dwelling place of God will be with his people, that he will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying for the old order of things has passed away. There is no need to panic when we know that we have that future secure ahead of us. But while we shouldn't panic, neither should we be complacent. If we are to love our neighbour, then we are to love as Jesus loved, sacrificially and with tears. Our neighbour has been barred from her school in Afghanistan, has had his universal credit cut, cannot afford their gas bill. It's not good enough for us to wear a beatific smile and point them to Revelation 21, telling them that, all will be well. It is a great joy to tell you that in Parliament there are many Christians of all political colours that we meet together, pray together and seek to consider our differences to be nothing compared to the unity we have in Christ. We may disagree on much, yet agree that Jesus Christ is our Lord and Saviour as we falteringly seek to serve him. Politics is a mucky business. There is compromise, intrigue, truth, half-truth and untruth, ambition, goodness, wickedness, godly ideals and ungodly ideals. But you could say the same about pretty much every other walk of life too. And since politics affects the lives of our neighbours on every inch of this planet, 
We should care about issues, big and small, make ourselves aware of some of the details and pray for the people making the decisions. The aim of this programme is not to recruit you into a life of active politics, though you shouldn't rule it out. It is instead to seek to help us all to think about politics from a biblical perspective, to encourage you to know that there are many Christians in politics and to lead us to pray as a community of believers for those who govern us and for those who are affected by their decisions. So we've done one better than Alan Partridge. We've got our second series. I pray that we will use that opportunity wisely and that together we will faithfully and humbly consider how Christians should think about the issues of our time, what obedience to God might look like as we form our opinions and how we can pray to God, our father, who cares intimately about every part of his creation, including those rascally politicians. A Mucky Business with Tim Farron. Well, our guest today is Dame Andrea Ledsom. Just like me, she was once a candidate for prime minister, but unlike me, she was plausible and got down to the last two. Um, she is the Member of Parliament for South Northamptonshire and has been since 2010. Um, though she stood for the leadership of the Conservative Party, after she withdrew, she took on various roles in the Cabinet, including Business Secretary, Environment Secretary and Leader of the House of Commons. Most recently, she chaired the very well attended, virtually, Parliamentary Prayer Breakfast and attends Bible studies with other MPs. Andrea, we're really honoured to have you with us. Welcome. And what did it feel like to be chairing and anchoring the Parliamentary Prayer Breakfast when there was just three or four of you in Westminster Hall and outside broadcasts right around the country where everything technically could have gone wrong? but didn't well it was it was actually a huge privilege to do it and uh, obviously having attended lots of them in person where there's about 800 people in Westminster Hall we were slightly rattling around just the three of us but uh, there was plenty of warmth in our conversation we had some decent croissant and it was uh, fantastic that nothing went wrong but um, actually I think in a way, the fact that it had to be virtual again, it reached out to more people and we had some lovely feedback. So, yeah, I really enjoyed it. I think you did it really well. It reminded me, those of us at a certain age will remember nationwide. It reminded me of that going around the country to outside, outside broadcasts everywhere. And I absolutely concur. In my patch, we did a, um, a session and I had something like 20 church leaders. There's no way we would have got all 20 church leaders down to Westminster Hall. So I thought you did a cracking job and we're really grateful to you for doing it. So I'd just love to explore with you really how you um, came to become a Christian, if it was a gradual thing or a, a thing that happened on a particular moment and what that means for you in your in your life today. So I wasn't raised as a Christian at all, really. When I was very small, we used to go to Sunday school, but that was about it. I don't remember going to church, but then I did start going when I was about 11 and for a time, I went to an evangelical church and even went to a church camp and really enjoyed it, but didn't really, um, I, I wouldn't say didn't really become a true Christian until when my children were born. And I just remember um, I, I got confirmed before I got married, but it was really when I was looking at my first son in his cot and thinking, wow, that's quite a miracle and that is really definitely not something that is of this earth and that really I think that that was really the point at which I really started to think yes I there is more to this Christianity and and since then my faith has grown over that last 25 years. Wow the heavens declare his glory and it's, I think often maybe we think too much about apologetics and all the rationality behind Christianity of which there is bags but sometimes just looking at God's creation is the thing that just reminds us there's a creator. So I thank you very much for sharing that with us, Andrea. We, because of the time available, we haven't got time to go into all the details. You're probably glad about that. Um, but I, you obviously went to university. You had a career in finance. Something triggered you getting into politics. What was it? Well, actually, I was first and foremost going to be an MP because when I was 13 and at my girls' grammar school, they were very ambitious for all of us. They weren't sort of girls' jobs and boys' jobs. And um, I was really terrified of a global nuclear war. So as a 13-year-old, I would lie awake thinking some idiot's going to press that red button because it was, of course, still the height of the Cold War. Mm. And so I decided I'm going to become an MP and save the world from a nuclear holocaust. 
And my teachers at school were like, great, yeah, do that. That's a really good idea. So uh, when I go into junior schools today, I like to say to them, so you have me to thank for the fact that you're still here. <laughs> That's an amazing story. And absolutely, those of us who grew up under the shadow of the bomb, it was a very a different kind of um, period to grow up under. I suppose we also recognise that there are different pressures today. But that sense of wanting to achieve something so great and so uh, significant, which led you to where you, you are, obviously it meant a, a career switch at some point in 2010. You know, senior position in, in the world of finance, you become a new MP. Was it scary switching careers and having to start at the bottom again, so to speak? Not really, actually. Um, I, I'd always known that I wanted to become an MP. And when my, I've got three kids, when my two boys were very young, I went through a phase of thinking actually couldn't bear life in the public eye. I just want to, you know, stay at home. But then actually, in fact, through having children and through some of the frankly appalling treatment of employers of women with young children actually made me all the more determined when my third one came along to think right I'm just going to change the world for other women this is completely unfair so I was always quite passionate about wanting to change the world for the better I love that um, that phrase God give me the serenity to accept what I cannot change, the courage to change what I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. And I've always been a bit of a kind of battler. You know, I really do want to change the world for the better. So for me, um, it was a no brainer. And I couldn't wait to get out of kind of paid employment and into politics, because it just did seem to me that that is the way you change the world for the better. And so you've begun to answer this question because something I think is is really genuinely interesting to me, and I think to a lot of Christians, we we think of politics as a mucky business. And one of the ways in which people assume it is a mucky business is because of personal ambition. Um, and so I guess the question I've got for you is: Is it okay for Christians in politics to be personally ambition ambitious? And and if so, what are the kind of parameters? I came into Parliament in 2010 not really thinking particularly about anything beyond being a member of Parliament. And, uh, and when I came here, I had what I called my three Bs, babies, banks and Brussels. And those were the three things that I wanted to change. And, um, and, and I never really thought about you know, that in terms of climbing the greasy pole. But of course, when you get here, that is the reality, that is the currency, is you know, you, you start off as a backbencher and then you need to sort of look at the next rung on the ladder. And, and unfortunately that really pervades this place and it actually, I think, accounts for some of the huge anxieties that MPs have about, you know, where am I going? What's the point of me? What am I doing? And, and it does make some people feel, I think, dissatisfied with what they can do as a backbencher. And, and actually I've always thought and continue to think that you can have a superb political career as a backbencher and you can achieve some really amazing things. But nevertheless, actually, if you really want to do some big things, then you've got to play the game. You've got to get yourself promoted. And I don't think that there's a problem with that. I've um, attended New Wine for many, many years with my sister and our kids. And always had this argument at, um, at some of the meetings where people will kind of argue from the from the front that, you know, you need to be humble. You need to not put, put your head above the parapet. Politicians are bad, blah, blah, blah. And I've always held the view, no, you are given certain gifts. And if you are wanting to fulfill your gifts, then you have to go for it. You can't just sit back. And so, yeah, I think ambition is perfectly fine. A Mucky Business with Tim Farron. We're talking with Dame Andrea Ledsom MP, the Conservative member for South Northamptonshire. She's a Christian. She's also a very significant Leave campaigner. Now, Andrea, um, I was there the night of the Wembley debate just before the, um, the referendum in 2016. And I tried to be gracious, objective and neutral where I can. I was on the B team, on the Remain team last night. I wasn't one of the three on the stage. I was one of the five on the second stage. Um, you were on that top stage. Um, and I'm uh, going to not spare your blushes by saying that I think, whilst Boris Johnson gets a lot of the plaudits, I thought you were the most effective performer that night. I think uh, take back control was such a powerful message. And I heard it delivered by you in a way which sounded credible. 
Um, now then, as you were chosen to be in the final three for that debate, did you have a sense of how um, how important that performance might be for the future of the country? I really did. And actually, it, you know, just you talking about it, I just think, oh, my goodness, <laughs> it was terrifying. I always remember we were sat on that bus at the back, like the sort of three naughty school kids at the back of the bus, me and Boris and Gisela. And Boris turned to me and said, I'm really scared. And I said to him, Boris, you're really scared. <laughs> you're used to this. Anyway, no, I, I did actually feel it was going to be a very important, very important night. Um, I'm not sure I fully realised how important, but at the same time, you know, going back to what you were saying before, is ambition right as a politician? I was so, so certain in my own mind that leaving the European Union was the right thing for the United Kingdom for the right reasons. And so, yes, ultimately, I was backing my very, very clearly held view that our future would be so much better outside of the EU. And I make no apology for that. So I was determined the extent to which I could influence the outcome, I was going to do that. Now, obviously, having uh, won the referendum, a series of events happened in the following days and weeks, must have felt like a complete whirlwind from you, for you. You appeared on that national stage. You did incredibly well. There became a, a leadership stroke prime ministerial vacancy. There was a contest. You got down to the last two and you withdrew and uh, Theresa May basically got crowned as prime minister. What did that feel like? Did it feel bruising personally? And as a Christian, how did you react to that? To what extent did you feel God's hand on your life? And did you rely on him at what must have been a really, really tumultuous time for you personally and for your family? Um, yeah, obviously it was very tumultuous, but um, ultimately it's about um, the reason I stood was because I felt I needed to stand up and be counted. I genuinely did not think that David Cameron would walk away. I was really shocked that he did. He always said he wouldn't. And I felt I couldn't therefore not be willing to own that situation. So that, that's why I stood. But ultimately, actually, it was um, the reflection of many days and talking to my um, Bible group leader and to a number of other Christians and people who I have a great deal of regard for um, about the fact that what was in the country's best interests. Mm. And um, the problem with being in the final two was that there was going to be a nine week campaign. The markets were in turmoil. There were already predictions of a recession. And what I was so concerned about was after nine weeks, if I won, there were already a number of colleagues saying that they would no confidence me. And as we've discovered, you only need a hundred of your side in the Conservative Party to know confidence you and you're back in a leadership campaign. On the other hand, if I lost, people would very legitimately be saying, what on earth did you make us wait nine weeks to get a new leader for? So that's why I withdrew. And so, you know, with the information I had at the time, I would make the same decision today. I mean, it, hindsight is a wonderful thing, but um, at the time it felt like the right decisions for the right reasons. Yeah, thank you, Andrew, for answering that. I think, obviously, you went on then to take on, I think I'm right in saying, three very senior uh, cabinet roles. Uh, having uh, taken those roles, obviously, you find yourself in a place where collective responsibility um, is, I think, and that can be a, a challenge for anybody, Christian or otherwise. To what extent, or is, is there an extent to which, uh, beyond which, it's hard for a Christian to accept collective responsibility when you think I've got to sign up to this and it challenges um, what my faith tells me is acceptable. Were there any instances or could there be any instances where you would think, you know, this far, but no further? Um, there have been in my career, as I'm sure for any Christian in politics, um, times where I've thought I can't, I just can't support this. And actually, um, it's not, as, as you well know, Tim, it's not just a matter of how you vote. It's actually a matter of how you engage with the debate, how you influence, how, how, how much you, you sort of use your time and your influence to get in there and try and change the outcome and so on. And very often it's working cross party. And so, you know, I could you know, probably give you 20 examples of 
cross-party working, of agreeing with colleagues on from opposite parties on particular policy areas. I think there's a real misunderstanding amongst the public, Christians and otherwise, about the extent to which we collaborate when we're outside of the chamber and the extent to which we agree on things. We might not agree on the means of getting there, but I think all politicians are trying to make the world a better place. I mean, there might be a few really rotten apples who are trying to achieve other aims, but um, Christian or of no of no faith or of other faiths, um, ultimately MPs on the whole are trying to make the world a better place. And so um, there have been very few times where I've voted against a three line whip, very few times, but actually engaging with the process, um, influencing, as you say, when I was in cabinet, I would speak very forcefully in cabinet at times. And ultimately I resigned as leader of the commons uh, because I felt that we were um, actually undermining the decision of the people to leave the European Union. So ultimately that led to my resignation. There were other examples, but mainly I felt my duty as a politician was to engage in the debate and try and influence the outcome. And I think I found that uh, in my experience of you in terms of how you deal with others graciously and kindly. I recall one instance where you, however, gave the former speaker, John Burko, a piece of your mind. Is there a moment where, <laughs> is there a moment where um, you, your, your capacity for grace can sometimes get stretched a little bit? <laughs> well, it was, a, it was a bit of a hold my beer moment. Um, <laughs> I mean, I, I think um, that there are times in politics also where you have to stand up and stick up for the rest of society. And actually in the whole issue as leader of the commons in the area of bullying and harassment, um, there were times where one, I really had to say, no, this, this cannot be tolerated. And in no uncertain terms, stand up and speak out. And, you know, so when, the speaker was essentially giving an opposition politician who should remain nameless an easy time over calling the prime minister of the day a stupid woman. It seemed to me that that was totally insulting and um, demeaning to the fabulous women across the country who do so much. And so, yeah, that was a that was a this far and no further. So, yes, I was possibly a little bit angry. Possibly. Yes, I was angry. <laughs> So as we come to the end of our time, Andrea, you are on the back benches, which I can tell you is, you know, a great place to be. Uh, how are you enjoying life there and uh, how are you able to influence and change things? Well, I'm, I'm so enjoying life on the back benches. It is a vastly different situation. Obviously, the COVID pandemic has kept me and all MPs incredibly busy helping constituents. But I am so delighted at last to be doing what is my real passion in politics, and that is trying to ensure that every baby gets the best start for life. So last July, over a year ago now, the Prime Minister invited me to chair an early years healthy development review, looking at the period from conception to the age of two and how we can really transform services in those early years to help families who are struggling so that they can give their babies the best start for life and we can really change our society for the better so it is the ultimate ambition for any politician so I'm delighted to be doing that and it has such cross-party support so working with colleagues from your party from the Labour Party even from the Scottish Nationalists which is a huge privilege. Andrea thanks so much what, what a, a fantastic use of your time so from preventing nuclear war to making sure that every child gets the best possible start um, that appears like a an ambition worth pursuing. Andrea, you've been a real blessing to interview. Thank you ever so much. Thanks, Tim. A Mucky Business with Tim Farron. Each week, we'll answer a question from you, the listener, about how Christianity and politics can work together. Maybe you're thinking through a particular issue or you're not sure why people disagree on a certain policy. If you've got a question, write it in in an email to farron at premier.org.uk. This week, we've got a question from Row in Sheffield. The media presents the culture in Parliament as being adversarial, disrespectful, humiliating, and sometimes righteously angry. And what's more, constituents get angry with their MPs. And sometimes politicians own strong convictions and they make them burst out in anger. So my question is this, how often do Christian politicians talk about coping with their own anger? Or how often do they support each other when they're being the target of someone else's anger. 
it's that age-old question, what would Jesus do? Ah, oh, such a great question, Rowan. It's one I think about a lot. Um, the Bible tells us, in your anger, do not sin. It doesn't say, don't be angry. In fact, actually, Jesus obviously was angry and angry at injustice, angry at unrighteousness. And so there are things that it's right to be angry about. I think the crucial thing for me is that politicians who are Christians need to treat one another and the wider public graciously, even when we disagree on an issue. And we've seen it recently over the universal credit uh, discussion, Christian politicians taking both sides of that debate. And we must be respectful for one another. One of the dangers is in uh, politics as Christians is we can think we've got to think we've got to be soppily neutral, if you like, on these issues. And we don't. If something is wrong, we have to call it out and to say so. Wrong is wrong. Right is right. Even if our understanding of it will be faltering and be based in upon, upon our own flaws and fallenness. Nevertheless, it's right to be passionate whilst at the same time showing grace towards those who think something different. Loving Heavenly Father, as we come to the end of our time together this week, we want to thank you for Andrea Ledsom, for uh, her commitment to you, for her love for you, and for her continued service of her community and of our country in Parliament. We want to lift up our country at this time, and particularly those people and those families who are struggling. We see many whose incomes are declining, and we see many whose outgoings are increasing. And that's a very, very stressful position for so many millions of people to find themselves in. So we pray for all of those who find themselves in hardship, that you provide for them, that you turn their hearts to you, uh, the one who has the answer to all their deepest needs. And we pray for all those in politics, particularly those who serve you, Lord Jesus, and seek to follow you, that our anger would be at injustice and that which is wrong and not at one another that you'd help Christians in politics to behave in ways which are gracious and be a strong and powerful witness to your truth. We thank you for your blessings upon our country and for putting many people in politics who are Christians. And we lift these things up to you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, that's all from us for this week. If you have any suggestions or ideas of things that you think we should be discussing in the coming weeks, guests we should have and questions we should answer, please do get in touch at farron at premier.org.uk. Well, next week we'll meet together again and we'll be speaking to Kate Forbes, who is the most senior politician in Scotland after Nicola Sturgeon. She's a Christian and in my humble opinion, she is the future. Thanks for listening. <laughs>